Welcome to Agent Talks with the Authors Guild Foundation. This is in collaboration with the Association of American Literary Agents and Literary Agents of Change. In this series, we're getting to know a literary agent and hear their perspective and advice on an issue in their wheelhouse. And we leave some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, literary agent Sarah N. Fisk is here with us to speak about the Modern Authors Press Kit and their fellow agent Tamara Kawar will uh, help moderate the conversation. Uh, there's the Q&A box in Zoom. Um, you, can, you can type and reply to each other in there, sort of a chat box. Closed captions are available. Um, and uh, yeah, let us know if you have any questions along the way. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our guests here today. Tamara Kawar is a literary agent at De Fiore and Company. And Sarah N. Fisk is an agent at Tobias Literary Agency, representing all genres in middle grade and young adult, as well as adult, science fiction, fantasy, romance, and select nonfiction. Uh, they host the podcast Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, and are one of the founding members of Disability in Publishing. Uh, Sarah is a former mechanical engineer who made the switch to publishing in 2011. Um, she's worked in the industry as an editorial assistant, author's assistant, publicist, art director, so a wealth of experience uh, on our hands here today. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Tamara. Thanks so much, Johnny. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. As Johnny mentioned, the Agent Talk series is hosted by the Authors Guild Foundation in partnership with the Association of American Literary Agents, the AALA, and Literary Agents of Change, LAOC. My name is Tamara Kawar. I'm a literary agent at DeFiori & Company. Along with being your moderator today, I'm also a member of the AALA and a co-director of the Literary Agents of Change Mentorship Program. Our mentorship program was founded to serve people from historically underrepresented groups in the agenting community and seeks to re increase retention and promotion. Um, we're so thrilled to see such a wonderful turnout for a member of our cohort, Sarah N. Fisk, um, who is leading this webinar on the Authors Press Kit. A reminder that if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please drop them in the chat. So without further ado, I'll let Sarah take it from here. All right, hi everybody. Um, so yeah, Modern Authors Press Kit. I love talking about this. Um, Mainly because, let me make sure my screen is all set up correctly so I can get this ready for you. So I do have a handout, um, which I think Authors Guild also sent it out in the email or they will send it out, but you can access it by going to this bit.ly link or using that QR code. I haven't checked the QR code in a minute, so hopefully that works. <laughs> um, but if not, the bit.ly link definitely works because I did use that today. Um, and this is also going to be at the end of the presentation. So if you miss it now, don't worry, you're going to get it. Um, okay, so I am a literary agent. Uh, that is why I I'm here today. But um, actually, most of my knowledge about press kits came about from before I was a literary agent. Uh, so I am Sarah Fisk, but I am also an author and I write under Sarah Nicholas. And then I also write romance under the name Aria Kane. So I have a lot of um, experience as an author. I was a book publicist and a publicity director for a mid-size um, romance and young adult publisher. And I am a library event planner specializing in author events and writing workshops. And I've been doing that for 11 years. And honestly, most of this workshop came from my frustration of working with authors who didn't have uh, press tip things to send me. So I was also a contributor for Book Riot for several years. Um, Book Riot is, if you are not aware, the um, largest independent book news website in North America is what we were told to say back then. Um, and then I was also on the board for Pitch Wars. I was a book blogger on my own, and I've hosted two YouTube shows, Pub Talk Live and Agent Chat Live, and now I host Queries, Quirks, and Quirks, which is a podcast. And I am also a literary agent, but um, like I said, most of my experience about press kits has come about because of the other work that I've done. Um, so why why do you want a press kit? <laughs> um, and I will say the oh, I'm going to talk about the next slide, but um, you want a press kit if you want media coverage or book reviews, or any of these things that are listed here. If you wanna attend a book festival, you wanna do author events, um, you wanna be interviewed by any kind of media. Sometimes if you wanna do school visits and library visits, you wanna be on a talk show, whatever it is, any kind of press coverage that you might want is when a media kit is gonna come in handy. 
And whenever you want those things, the people who are in charge of booking those things want enough concise, concise is an important word here, concise info about you as an author to make their decision. As an author is also an important bit. Um, there's no reason to put a whole bunch of personal information in your press kit. And so what we're trying to do is give them the information that they need and nothing more and nothing less. And especially in an instance where someone might be doing you a favor or um, you know, there are a lot of people who want that attention or want that opportunity, the easier that you can make it for someone to promote your book or book you or make the decision or make the case for booking you, the higher your chances of a favorable outcome. So that's really what a press kit is all about, is making it easy for someone who's booking these opportunities to work with you, both before, during, and after the event. So um, there is kind of this, this idea of what a press kit is that a lot of people hold that is um, a little bit of an older idea. We think of it sometimes as like, you know, what this one document and this it's kind of this like old fashioned printout, you know, with your headshot in the corner and information or whatever. And that's not really the way that I think about press kits anymore. I think that press kits isn't one thing and it, it often changes depending on what kind of opportunity you're seeking out. And we're gonna talk about all those different elements and what's going to go into a press kit and also the way that you can manage your press kit so that the people that need some information will get it, that kind of thing. Uh, one size does definitely not fit all. You're not gonna get, send the same information to a um, elementary school as you are going to send to like a newspaper, for example. So you wanna save each piece independently. So you're gonna to wanna to have your headshot saved as its own file, you know, for example. And then you're also gonna kind of save that information in various combinations, which is gonna be specific to your situation. And you wanna give them exactly what they asked for um, and nothing more and nothing less. And brevity is key a lot of times, especially when it comes to traditional media, people are making these decisions so quick. They don't have a lot of time and they have hundreds of people trying to get their attention. So being as, as brief and as concise as you can while still getting your point, your point across is gonna be very, very important, especially in traditional media. You wanna start putting this together about six months before publication, just to give you some time to like, you know, get all, everything sorted out and give everything ready. Um, because you're going to start getting, depending on how you're publishing and, you know, what your publisher is doing, you may start getting media requests like three months in advance or sometimes even further in advance. So you want to make sure that you have this already so that you're not trying to scramble to put it all together right when someone's asking you for it. And even if you don't have a publication deal, it's a good idea just to start doing some of this because some of it, I mean, obviously you can change it as your situation changes, but some of it is not gonna change very much once you get published. Obviously all the book info is. All right, so this is the absolute minimum that you need to have. And again, these are not things that people traditionally think of as a press kit, but they are. They are if you go to an author's website and you click on the press kit link, these are the minimum things that should be available on their website. A high resolution author photo. We're gonna talk more about what makes a good author photo in a minute. And a high resolution book cover. And I will say, whenever someone is asking you for a book cover, what they are asking for is that rectangular shaped image right there. They're not asking for the book flat image, which I've been sent a lot of times. And you need to send both of these things in a JPEG. Don't send them as a PDF. Don't send them, which has happened to me multiple, multiple times, copied into a Word document and then sent as a Word document that minimizes the file, makes the file so small that your, your picture is gonna be blurry if we put it on anything. Don't do that. Send it as a JPEG, um, unless otherwise requested, of course, but every um, platform that I have ever used can use a JPEG. So that's why I say JPEG. You also want to have your book description and links, and we're going to talk more a little bit into, about the details on that as well, and a short author bio. And again, we're going to talk more about author bios in a second as well. So here are some sections that may be part of your press kit. One is going to be the bio. One is going to be the contact info, including your social media links. Social media links should be included in your contact info. It's gonna be your author photo, 
your basic book info. And I'm going to break down basic book info and book promotional info in a, a future slide. And then if you are, especially if you're seeking out speaking topics, um, you want to include a list of topics that you could possibly speak about uh, that would be related to your book. And um, you also may want to put interview questions or FAQ in there, a little bit more about that in a minute, especially if you're seeking out media opportunities where maybe they don't have a lot of time to do research on you and develop the questions. Those interview questions can often be a really good starting point for the host. When it comes to speaking topics, I always recommend that you make sure you are trying to find something that is a value add to the listeners, right? So whether whether or not they care about your book, they're going to be interested in what you're talking about. So for example, years ago, V.V. Barnes, who wrote Olivia Twisted, which was an Oliver Twist retelling with hackers, um, she did a workshop for my library, a talk for my library on why... Um, it's important and the benefits of doing retellings of the classics. So that was an example of a workshop or a talk where even if people weren't necessarily interested in her, haven't heard of her as an author before, they might be interested in the topic itself. All right, when it comes to your author bio, you um, there are a couple different links that are often used in different um, mediums. So you may wanna get these ready to go. Um, you wanna keep it relevant and interesting. Sometimes you're gonna want a longer bio, very rarely, I should say, you're gonna want a longer bio, but you may wanna get that ready. Um, if someone's doing a really in-depth piece on you, that's something that you're gonna to wanna to send them. And that may include more of your, you know, kind of personal details or your history or your education history or whatever it may be. Um, but for the most part, you wanna keep it relevant and pretty, pretty short. Also, um, make sure you brag about yourself. You know, if you've won awards, put them in there. Um, it, your bio is not an opportunity for you to be humble. <laughs> Please make sure that you're bragging about yourself. You're putting your accomplishments in there. You may also want to customize the audience. And we're going to, um, I'm going to show you in a minute what that might look like. And then some links. So probably the most common link you might use is something that's like 50 to 100 words, something that might go on the back cover of a cop of a book or inside flap of a book, you know, um, about 100 words is pretty common. Um, 50 words is a bit short. Some people do challenge, do find it challenging to go that short. But, um, and then you may also want to have a very short bio. So for example, when I do um, writing conferences for the library, the, the place that I have on our website to put it, which is not under my control, it's like a technical complaint restraint that's put on me, um, is I can only do up to 30 words, right? And so um, sometimes it really helps to have just a very short bio ready to go. And um, as like, if, if the opportunity that you're seeking out is focused on your book, then the bio should veer a little bit shorter. But if the focus of the interview or whatever it is, is on you as an author, on your career or whatever, then you wanna veer a little bit longer on the bio. Another important thing that some people might want to put on there is name pronunciation. Even if you um, don't uh, don't think you need it, sometimes you will. My name is um, nine letters and and pretty common, and people mispronounce all the time. So I think that everyone should have a uh, name pronunciation if they can, and um, they can be really helpful to event hosts. But your author bio should always always be written in third person. Um, even on your website. And I know it seems a little unnatural at first, but if I, as an event host or a, a journalist is, try, is trying to um, take your bio from your website and use it for my purposes, I obviously can't introduce you at an event with a first person bio, right? And um, it's, and then, so I have to do extra work if I want to convert it. And that's what you want to avoid. Um, so your bio on your website and everywhere should always be third person. Make it professional, but a little bit personal, put a little bit of personal touch on it. There we go. So here's a quick example of one of my bios. Um, so this, I tried to focus on myself as an author. It's really hard because I have my agent and author identities are so intertwined. But um, so Sarah Nicholas is a recovering mechanical engineer, library event planner and author who lives in Orlando with a gray fluffy cat who thinks she's a Labrador. She actually just got up and walked behind me. Um, they write YA novels as Sarah Nicholas and romance under the name Aria Kane. Sarah's published both traditionally and independently, has worked in the publishing industry, 
as an editorial intern, editorial assistant, publicist, publicity director, cover artist, and art director. They're also a literary agent, Tobias Literary Agency, and host the podcast Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. When not writing, they can be found playing volleyball or drinking wine. Sarah is represented by Rebecca Potos of Reese Literary Agency. So if I wanted to adjust this for a YA reader audience, um, the things that I might remove is I might remove my experience in the industry, like as, you know, um, the editorial assistant publicist, all that, because um, as I, if I'm speaking to a reader industry or a reader audience, they probably don't really care that I've had all these roles, right? If I'm speaking to a young adult audience, I'm definitely going to remove the part about drinking wine. And um, I'm going to focus on, you know, Sarah and not Aria, right? So um, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about adjusting your bio a little bit for your audience. So here is a short version for a YA reader audience. Sarah Nicholas is a recovering mechanical engineer, library event planner, and author who lives in Orlando with a gray fluffy cat who thinks she's a Labrador. When not writing, they can be found playing volleyball or listening to podcasts. So I switched out the drinking wine for listening to podcasts, something that's a little bit more appropriate for a teen audience. So if I wanted to send this to a writing group audience, if I wanted to get, you know, a uh, I wanted to teach at a writing group. This is something I'm going to focus more on my professional experience as an industry professional and less on both my personal details and myself as an author. Um, even though it is relevant that I'm an author, um, what people really want to hear about is my experience in the industry. It's very similar to what they read at the beginning of this, but also included information about, uh, you know, what kind of submissions I take. So contact info. So contact info is definitely gonna, uh, I know, the, so if I ever say anything that seems like you're thinking, oh, this seems like it should be really obvious. Um, it's because it's happened to me <laughs> where I didn't have that information. And so um, I, I know it seems obvious, but make sure your name is somewhere, um, hopefully multiple places. I have definitely been contacted by authors before where their email is not their name, they did not sign their name, and the link that they send me does not, the website that they have does not have their name anywhere on it. And that's definitely something that you, it seems so obvious that you probably are, you already assume that it's on your website or it's in your email or whatever. So make sure your name's there. <laughs> um, you also definitely want to have your email available. Um, I personally don't recommend contact forms unless you are slightly better than average at maintaining a website because the contact forms that come with most website providers um, break a lot. I have people all the time, all the time contacting me from emails I've sent them like two years ago where they're like, oh, I didn't even realize my emails weren't coming through. Um, so if you can put, if you know how to handle a, a form and you, um, you know, uh, test it regularly, then maybe you can do a form, but um, try to find a way you can, you know, write your email in such a way that uh, the bots can't get to it. So you also want to have your phone number on some contact info, but do not put this online. Do not put this on your website. This is only whenever you're sending um, a press kit to someone privately an email and they may want to have your phone number. Definitely want to include your website links and any social media links that you have. Uh, whenever someone's trying to promote an event, it's a lot easier for them if they need information to go get it from your website or um, if they want to, you know, tag you on social media and their post promoting something. It's a lot easier if they already have all those links ready to go. You may also want to include, again, depending on what purpose you're using this for, who to contact for rights, media inquiries, event booking, and review copies, if that person is not you. Um, if you ha just have your email address on the site, everyone is going to assume that you are the person to contact for these things. If you do have an event agent or if you do have, you know, a literary agent or a publicist that is supposed to receive these inquiries for you, you want to make sure to put that info on your website and also in whatever um, documents that you're sending out when it's applicable to the situation. All right, let's talk a little bit about author photos. So author photos, um, they need to look professional. That's really what it comes down to. There is a link on the handout that goes to um, a post that I have about 
how to fake a professional headshot. I think it's also in the slide that you're going to see next, but it's going to be a lot easier for you to access it from the handout. Um, but I get, like, you y'all would not believe <laughs> some of the headshots that I get sent. Um, so it needs to be professional. It needs to be high resolution. It needs to, um, if you're taking your own, lighting is key. Like lighting, you can you can take an incredible photo with your cell phone if you have good right lighting. So lighting is super key if you're doing your own. You don't want any distractions in the background. You want kind of a neutral background or a blurred out background, whether that's a bookshelf or a plain wall or, you know, a landscape behind you or whatever it is. Uh, the the behind me in my headshot, I took my own headshot and uh, it has, you know, this like kind of untreated wood background. People love it. People always ask me where it is. And it's actually the trash enclosure at my parents' house that's built to keep bears out of the trash. So, um, you know, you can find a decent uh, background anywhere you look pretty much. It should definitely be a JPEG. I may repeat this multiple times because it's so important. Do not send it as a PDF again. Do not copy it into another document and send it to me. Um, don't use any weird file format. And the other part of that too is like, if it is on your website, it needs to be downloadable as a JPEG. WordPress is doing this thing where if you put a, a picture on a website, I think it's WordPress and maybe a different service actually, now that I think about it. When I right click and try to save that word, that um, picture, it wants to give it to me as a web key file, which I cannot open. I have I have Photoshop and I can't open a web key file. So um, make sure that on your website, your your photos are downloadable in a regular format. Also include if if there needs to be photographer credit given, make sure you include that in your info as well. Um, it should also have an identifiable unique file name. So something like Sarah Nicholas headshot.jpg, not author photo JPEG. And I am going to show you why on the next slide. So on the next slide, back in my book blogging days, I might have a folder that looks something like this where it says author photo, author pick, headshot, my author pick, photo, whatever. So if your file name is easier for me to find, I'm just going to be less frustrated in general, right? So if, you're, if you're, um, your headshot needs to have your name in it and it needs to be clear what that file is when I download it. This is the link that I mentioned. That's a blog post on how to fake a professional author photo. If you're not, if I like, obviously, if you can't get a professional headshot session done, that is great. And that is going to be, you know, give you the best results. But I understand that you may not be able to afford it, especially if you don't have a book deal yet, or you got a rather small advance on your book deal. I definitely understand, um, you know, not being able to spare a couple hundred dollars for a headshot. So uh, if, if you are going to do your own, just make sure you do it well. I've been sent so many headshots where people, you know, it's like, Obviously it was at a wedding and there was a professional photographer there and they they like cut out the other people. So you see their like hair and their body parts around their face and they're not even the focal point. So they're slightly blurry. Um, I've definitely had, I had someone sent me one that was like after they had a meal, someone had taken a photo of them and the lighting was awesome. So they decided to use this. But the problem is visible in the photo right, right below their chin is all the dirty dishes from the meal that they had just ate, you know. So um, take a couple minutes and really try to make sure that your photo is professional. It's going to leave you with the best first impression. Um, people want to connect with you as a person. And so you want to make sure that your headshot reflects, you know, the best version of you so that you can, um, um, so people are not, so people are proud to put it on their publications and stuff like that. All right, now we're going to talk about basic book info. And this is thing, a thing a lot of people kind of fail to put on their website or in their, um, you know, in their press kit. Um, but definitely a cover is included in the basic book info. Uh, the category and genre is another thing that may seem obvious. You, you may just assume that people know what your category and genre are. But if you list it out, it's a lot easier for us to know. Um, if you have a log line, you know, put something like that in there. 
uh, and then description. And by description, I think I'm going to talk about this in the next slide. So I'll save that for the next slide. Um, and then publication date, ISBN, retail price, format, trim size, and page count. And those seem kind of silly. There should, there should be info that you have. You're not going to include this in everything. But you, there is one particular place that loves it, loves it when you send this info. Loves it. And those are library acquisition departments. People who buy books for libraries love it when you send this info. Um, and you may want to also have a sample chapter. You know, if people uh, want to just kind of check out your writing, it's optional. Some people do and some people don't. Um, but it can be really helpful if someone's trying to determine if you're a good fit for their opportunity. You, you also want to include where to buy, um, especially if you have a deal with a local bookstore where people can get signed copies, you know, from your local bookstore, definitely, definitely make sure that that info is in there. So in the book description, there are two links that we sometimes use. Most often we're going to use the sales blurb. So that's like what goes on the back cover of the book, what goes in, you know, the description on Amazon and the description on Goodreads. That's what I'm talking about there. Um, but then you may also want to have just like a two line summary for if, uh, especially in radio, people really like to be able to sum up a book in like one or two sentences whenever they're introducing you or talking about the book. Um, so you may want to have that available as well. Usually you're not going to put a lot of marketing hype or editorializing here. Things where people are saying, oh, it's a fast paced adventure. That's what I mean when I'm talking about editorializing. There is a space for that though, and we're going to talk about it. Um, and remember, the only purpose of this description is to make the reader want to read more. And the reader can be someone who's booking you for a, you know, a journalistic um, opportunity or someone who's booking you for an event or something like that. Now we're going to talk about book promotional info, which is very related and should usually be kind of in the same area. Whenever you're sitting along, it's it's probably going to be right after the other. You may want to have some taglines, especially if you're in an opportunity where the person likes to do, do a lot of social media promotion. And if you can give them like a tweetable little quick summary of your book, um, that can be really helpful. If your book has won any awards or honors, definitely put that info here. If your book has received any blurbs or review quotes, you want to make sure that you are including that there as well. You can also have excerpts available. This is optional. It's usually a second document. This was much more popular back when like blogs were all the rage when everyone promoted on book blogs all the time. So I don't see them used as much very often, but it can be a really good thing for you to have ahead of time before your book launches in case anyone ever asks you about it. Usually your contract is going to tell you, your publishing contract is going to tell you how much of a book you can share without asking for the publisher's permission. So make sure you check that. And this is where you editorialize. This is where you say all the great things, tell people how your book is so great. And it works even better going back up to those awards and blurbs and book review quotes. It works even better if you're like, I'm not saying it's great. All these people are saying it's great. Um, so and that can be really useful. Also, if you have any cool book photos, people like to do those book photos where it looks like a 3D version of your book or whatever. And there is a link in the checklist for a place where you can make one of these. Um, but just make sure that this is this is in addition to your cover. Your cover should just be a clean, rectangular, plain book cover file. So some other things that you might want to have that are optional or additional is speaking topics. You know, if you are looking to do speaking gigs at places, come up with some speaking topics that people are going to be interested in. Also, if you are looking to book events, you probably want to have your location somewhere, listed somewhere, whether it's in your pitch about your speaking or it's in your bio. Um, it's for me, I book events for a library. We don't have a huge budget. So it's a lot easier for me to book someone who's from the state that I live in versus someone who is, you know, on the other side of the country because uh, the costs for that are going to be much higher. So it's important to know the location a lot of the time. If you have suggested interview questions, or if you don't come up with some, if there's something you really want to talk about in interviews and no one ever asks you a question that might lead into you talking about that, go ahead and put that in the interview question, you know, um, set yourself up for telling stories that you want to tell. Um, some people like to include a social media head header image. This is kind of like a fun, different thing. There are a lot of Canva templates. If you are not a graphic designer, you don't feel like you can do it yourself. 
Okay, so um, sometimes the kind of like older view on a press kit is what some people now might call one sheets or cell sheets or pitch sheets, or there's multiple different names for them. Um, these are documents that you're often gonna send um, for specific media outlets, for bloggers, for teachers or librarians, for event hosts. These are gonna be documents that you create with, with a specific purpose in mind. And I'm gonna show you an example, but it, I created this like 12 years ago. I don't know, not that long ago. I created it a long time ago. Um, so it's not, it's not I, I don't love it anymore. <laughs> It is the only example that I currently have to show you. So please just be gentle. <laughs> um, and so this is a document that I created. I was going to, I was invited as an author to uh, a day before school sem semester started where all of the elementary and middle school and high school librarians were going to be there for a training day. And then there was a, you know, exhibit hall kind of situation um with you know different services and whatever but they had they had an author service so they had a whole bunch of authors there uh where the librarians could just go down the line and see if they were interested in hosting any of the authors at their school so that's what I created this for all right so it has my name at the top it has a bio here you can tell that that is old because it includes my dog who has passed away and it also includes pronouns that I don't use anymore. Um, and then it has info about the two books that I had out at the time. And then down here, I have you know a little summary about what I like to speak about, uh, some additional information that might um, you know convince you that I might be a good speaker. Um, then I have these topics and um, workshop topics and speaking topics. And then my basic info, where I'm traveling from, how much I'll charge, um, you know, who to contact, and then also um, some of the places that I had spoken before. I really wanted this to be on one sheet because of the like quick nature of this fair. If you're sending it, um, I know I have an example in the checklist actually. If you're sending it and you want more information available, um, and there's a really good example for that about Christina Farley's um, document that's in the, in the checklist. So your website, your website is often the only press kit that most people will ever see. And so you wanna make sure that you have a lot of this information available on your website. At the very, very least, you should have about me, your book info and contact me. And this should be above the fold, which is a newspaper term, but it basically means once your website is loaded, the person should not have to scroll in order to find where they can find this information at, right? So you wanna be immediately apparent where they can get this information. You also may wanna include both in your press kit and on your website, um, media appearances that you've done. So if you've been on a podcast before, if you've been on a YouTube show before, if you've been on news, if you've been interviewed, if you were able to link to that appearance, definitely, definitely do. Um, FAQ, I mentioned it a couple of times, it does help interviewers come up with questions to talk to you about. And if you don't have, because sometimes people are like, well, no one really asked me questions. How could I have FAQs? Um, if you don't have them, make them up. <laughs> like this is pretty much the only time I'm going to tell you lie. It's okay. Um, think of questions that might be frequently asked, you know. And some of the things, um, most of the things you want to be, um, make them downloadable. So whether that's a whole press kit folder, um, uh, you know, one sheets if you make them, especially if you're doing school visits, uh, your headshot should be downloadable, your book cover should be downloadable. If you have classroom guides, that should be downloadable. If you have book club guides, if your book lends itself well to book club, um, then you definitely wanna have book club guides available on your website for people who are interested in, you know, doing a book club about your book. Okay, so now that you have all this information, you put it all together. Um, what do you do with it? <laughs> um, so especially if you're not particularly tech savvy, um, you might wanna consider putting everything in a Dropbox or a Google Drive folder or some other easy to use file sharing where you can just give someone a link and all of, all of these elements are going to be very easily easy to find right in this folder they all need to be labeled so um, whenever they log into or they open this folder uh, there is going to be a file that says author name headshot 
there's going to be a file that says, you know, book title, book info, and it's going to have all the information that we talked about. It's going to, um, it's going to have, you know, FAQ slash interview questions. That's a separate document. So if they want that, they can take that piece. That way they can take the pieces that they need. Um, I do not recommend that if you have a press kit, the only way that someone can access that info is to download it. If there is some way to make it viewable before download, I definitely recommend you do it that way, which is why I recommend Dropbox or Google Drive because that does it automatically. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. And the reason why is because a lot of people are you know, hesitant to download files if they're not really sure, um, especially if they're, they're just kind of trying to get initial information about you and they don't really know about you, they may be hesitant to download a file. Um, they may just wanna be able to view it from their browser. Um, I know you've probably all experienced this, you know, when you go to a, a restaurant's website and you just want to see the menu and they make you like download a PDF of the menu. It's so frustrating that that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> you want to host it on your website or you want to either host it or link to it on your website. If you have the ability to host it on your website, yes, go ahead, do that, please. Um, but if not, you can you can also link it as well, as I mentioned above. Whenever you are, someone contacts you about a, an event or your publisher sets you up with an event and someone contacts you, hey, can you send me a book cover, a bio and a headshot? That's, you know, you're gonna send that information exactly what they requested. Whenever you are requesting a specific opportunity, whether it's a book review or an appearance at an event or a media, media coverage or interviews or, you want to go to a festival or anything like that, you want to also send this info when you are requesting, you know, opportunity. And also, again, uh, try to minimize attachments. So whatever you can put in the body of the email, um, you can do that. You don't have to really put your headshot, you know, if you're requesting right off the bat. Um, but you are going to include a link to your website where they can find that information if they wanted to. So um, just try to use your best judgment on figuring what, what are they going to need in order to make a decision about whether or not they want to offer me this opportunity. That's what you're going to send. And um, it's not the same every time. So I, I can't give you like a list of exactly who to send what to or what to send to whom. But I did give you a checklist. And, um, you know, whenever you're requesting, just um, try to use your best judgment on what that, that person is going to need from you. All right, so I have a couple examples that I wanted to share with you if we had time, and it looks like we do have a little bit of time. So I am gonna do um, that. These are also included at on the second page of the checklist handout. So if you wanna check them out on your own, feel free to do that. Dahlia Adler, if you are not familiar with her, she is another person who is as frustrated by the lack of author's media kits as I am. So um, I love her, her website. So this is just a link on her website and um, it has her photo It's downloadable and it's, it says who to give the photo credit to. Um, all info and files are downloadable here and that is a Google Drive folder. Hear me pronounce my name here. And she has teachingbooks.net, by the way, has a lot of author pronunciations on their website. And so she does have that available there. And, um, and then she has a short bio right here. Then she has her standard bio. That's, I would judge is probably around 80, 90 words. She has all her social media links. She has all her buy links for all her books and she has a significant number. So um, a lot of links there. And then she also has the anthologies that she has been in. So that's great to have. And then she also have, we, I didn't mention this, but by links to foreign editions, which I think is really cool. Those can sometimes be hard for an author to chase down. Another thing that I really like too is she has um, cover design info for some of the books. Um, yeah, so love Dahlia. Great. It's all organized. You know exactly where to go for what you're looking for, you know. And this is just the one that's publicly available. I'm sure she has specialized ones that she sends to people. So um, let's see. I did want to um, show you Erin and Trada Kelly's as well. And Erin, I love, love Erin. 
she is one of the coolest people um, that I've ever met. She's just a wonderful human. Um, but she has, so she has her about Aaron info right here. She has headshots. She has a long bio. And then she also has just kind of these fun questions. She writes for children, right? So people love to talk about these kind of things with her. And then if you click on press kit, She'll also have the short bio, the long bio, this large, large version of her photo. Then you can go to books and you can see every book that she has, when it came out, a couple of quotes, you know, um, and then a learn more, which will take you into kind of a more in-depth page that will have even more information about that book. I love the way our website is laid out. I could talk all day about how much I love this. Then she also has educator resources. Um, she, again, writes for children. She's an award-winning children's author. She speaks at um, schools, you know. And so she has this link that's Teach Aaron's Books. And it's a whole bunch of information on conversation guides um, for teachers for some of her books. Love it. Um, and then she also has, she has where you can peek inside her notebook. So this is just a fun feature that for the kids, you know, she takes pictures of different notes that have made it into the book. And then she has her own section for awards and um, interviews. She's done a million. So she's won so many awards. So she needs a whole separate page for it, which is wonderful. I love that for her. Um, and then we have the contact page, right? And so she has, this is her literary agent. This is who contact for film, for school bookings, you know, media and publicity. Um, for publicists or for blurbs if you want if you're an author you want to go blurb so um and then it has a contact form and hopefully I'm sure that it works because she's amazing um so I, there are a couple other uh -oh. there are a couple other that are included in the checklist so definitely check those out I like them for different reasons Sharon's has a pronunciation guide right at the top um so I, in my opinion, if someone has a pronunciation guide that clear on their website, there's no excuse for you mispronouncing their name, right? So, um, and then also there's a, this is an older version, I will say, but it is, Christina Farley is a local author to me, but she used to be a, a teacher. So she has a really in-depth um, understanding of what teachers need and want in order to book author events. Um, and so she has this PDF that is multiple pages, but it's just, it's really great. If you are interested in specifically booking school events, I definitely recommend you check that out. And that again is a longer one that she's going to send like via private email specifically to people who are interested in hosting her. She also, she did that author event that I was talking about where we met with library um, librarians and she had those printed out for the ones who are interested in talking to her as well. So definitely check those out. Okay. Yeah, we do have time for questions. So this is the link again for the handout for anyone who wants it. Um, and so you can go to that. I think All Through School is also going to send that link out to people. So, um, and then you can find me, my, my agent website is sarahnfisk.com. So you can learn more about me as an agent. You can find me on Twitter still for now. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram too, but I mainly just post pictures of, um, of food, honestly. Um, and I'm also on TikTok. So, you know, find me and um, hopefully we can connect there. And I am ready for questions. If I think, Johnny, are you going to come on? Okay. Cool. Awesome. Hi. Thank you so much for this informative presentation. I don't know about you, Johnny, but I learned so much. So this is great. Um, we do have some pre-submitted questions that I have for you. Uh, the first one is, um, is it ever advisable to do a physical press kit? If so, when? Yeah, I did kind of mention that um, when I was talking. I guess I didn't address it explicitly, but most of the time, I would say 99% of the time you're doing a virtual press kit. The only time you're going to really want to do a, a written press kit is if you are in a situation where it's going to be harder to share that, such as the festival that I mentioned. You know, if, if you're going to an event that is specifically earmarked for that kind of interaction, um, very, very occasionally news outlets will want you to send um, something printed out, but 
almost all the time, everyone's going to want an email. And I will say, don't, don't waste a lot of time and money just printing out press kits and, and mailing them out to mailing lists. Um, uh, so for example, at my library, we get people sometimes who will mail us a press kit and then we're like, oh, that's great. Can you please fill out this form? Because we have a form specifically for people who want to do events with us. And we cannot proceed until that form has been filled out. And so honestly, just send an email is going to save you a lot of time and money. Um, and if they do want one, then you can send one, but usually you're not going to send a printed one. That makes sense. Um, a kind of nitty gritty question, but it's come up a, a few times in the Q&A. Um, when you talk about a high resolution JPEG, uh, do you have like a, a file size approximately like between this DPI and this DPI? Like what, what works for you usually? Yeah, I always tell people, um, ideally the smallest dimension should be a thousand pixels. Um, and so that's just a rough, you know, guideline for you. Uh, we can often use ones that are 300, 400, 500. So if you have one that's like 500, it's not a big deal. Um, but if you have one, so for example, at my work, we create a, um, a slide for authors when they visit us. And so we put that photo up on a screen and it is six foot tall, right? So um, a thousand is going to look decent at that size. Um, and if you know, don't make it like too huge. Like if, it's, if a dimension is more than 10,000 pixels, you may want to make that a little bit smaller because that file size is going to be insane. But uh, yeah, that's a, a guide. But if it's like 500, if the smallest dimension is 500 pixels, then you're, you're good for most situations. But if you can get a little bit bigger, that's good. Thanks. Um, so this also came up a few times and was also a pre- um registered question, which is, do you have any tips for finding contact info or who to address when approaching media outlets? Um, no, because everyone does it a little bit differently, which is so frustrating. Um, but the main tip I have is just like, go to their website and look extensively at their website. Um, you know, like click as many things as you can, look at as many pages as you can. Um, and often, if you do that, you're going to find the information that you're looking for, or you're going to find an email where you can very politely ask for whatever information that you need. Um, yeah, so it's all over the place. I know, for example, for my podcast, Queries and Quamps and Quirks, I have a form to fill out. Um, and it is, you know, it's very prominent on my website um, and it's listed or it's mentioned in every episode. And so if someone, does email me at like a totally different email address, my work, my day job email address, for example. And I was like, hey, I'd like to be on Quirks, Quams, and Quirks. So I do get a little bit annoyed because I'm like, the info is, is right there. So make sure you look before emailing. Um, you had mentioned, um, you know, writing information about the books um, on your website when sending out uh, a one sheet. We had a question about reviews. Um, Where's the best place to include them? And do you usually include the full review or is it more customary to include a pull quote? Yeah, um, almost all the time you're gonna wanna include a pull quote, quote uh, if you're seeking, especially media appearances or event appearances. Only time you might wanna include the full length of, of a review is if you're specifically asking for a library or a school to buy your book. Um, that's that's whenever they're gonna use, they do have access to those reviews so they can look them up. But most of the time you just wanna include like the two or three most impressive sentences about the review. And you can do it like Erin did on her books page where she had the description at the top and then she just had like two or three lines um, of two or three different reviews right underneath that info. Okay, thanks. Another question uh, that was pre-submitted, how much does uh, this vary based on genre? You spoke a little bit about, you know, tailoring things for the kids market, um, but um, would that sort of uh, vary based, basically like would like a, a library get a, a press kit for a children's book, whereas like a adult book may not, or how, what are the differences? Yeah, um, it's going to look, pretty much the same across genres. 
except for in very specific situations. So for example, if you are a science fiction fantasy author and you're looking to speak at a science fiction fantasy convention, especially the smaller ones, a lot of times those are fan focused, right? And they have um, panels on all different kinds of topics. So you may include in there, which you wouldn't include anywhere else, um, what things that you're kind of a fan of, if you can talk about any topics that are typically discussed at science fiction fantasy conventions, you may want to add that info in there. Um, and uh, nonfiction authors, you are expected to put more information about yourself, your following, your area of expertise than you are if you're a fiction author. So keep that in mind as well. Um, but and obviously the, the way that you talk to a library is going to be different if you are a kid lit author versus an adult author, but um, like you're still going to kind of include the same information. You're just like if you're only an adult mystery thriller author, you're not going to be trying to like talk to a, a story time, right? For example, so um, that should come naturally the way that you change it based on your genre. I have a couple of other questions. Um... One is a little bit kind of adjacent to this conversation, which is what are your thoughts on hiring an independent publicist or marketer? Um, if you are someone, if, how do I say this kindly? Um, if you are someone who might be doing a lot of media appearances, and I'm talking about like, not local media, but like, you know, you know, not your community paper, but like, the, the local news station, the local NBC affiliate or whatever, and podcasts and, um, you know, national news outlets. I think in that place, a publicist could be helpful mainly for, because, but you do have to do very a lot of due diligence and making sure that the publicist has success in placing interviews like that um, because they can send an email, but um, they're getting literally hundreds of emails a day. Uh, and so it helps if you have a publicist who has a proven track record in securing, you know, those kind of media outlets. Um, I don't, I don't want to say like it's, it's not a good idea to hire a publicist or um, someone like that. But for the most part, most people that I know who have done it have felt like it was not worth the money that they paid. Um, but there are of course exceptions, and there are of course like really great publicists out there. That can help you a lot so it really depends on your situation and also if you can't afford to spend that money like if you literally wouldn't go to vegas and put that money down on the table then don't do it right um don't put yourself in a financial hardship situation uh in order to hire a publicist for sure because you probably will not see a return on that investment in the way that you would like Um, yeah, and I would also add for folks who are being traditionally published, um, it's often a conversation you can have with your agent depending on um, the perceived uh, publicity or marketing investment of the publisher that you're observing. Like if you're seeing that your publisher is doing zilch, then it may be something that, you know, you have a conversation with your with your agent about like, is it worth it? Um, and what will the added value be? Um you know, conversely, if your publisher is doing the most, um, then, you know, it may not be worth it. Yeah. And it, it definitely like varies by situation. There are times when it can feel like it was really worth it and they, they had a great experience. Um, but I, you just really, really need to do your due diligence and researching a publicist before you, you hire them and uh, make sure that they are seeing results for their other clients. Um, talk to their other clients as it's the same as getting an agent talk to the publicist other clients and see how they feel about it too i think some people are wondering uh maybe they thought their publishing company was going to take care of a lot of this for them um would you say that they should the author should do this stuff and share it with the publishing team or ask them about it how, how does that relationship work yeah so it kind of it depends it varies publisher to publisher it also varies contract to contract <laughs> um and so a publisher should at the very least have a form that you fill out that has a lot of this info on it, like the bio and the links and stuff like that. Um, and sometimes 
they ask you to create that stuff or you know I've seen people with really big deals the publisher really like handholds and helps them build this kind of stuff um but sometimes they don't and um you know, sometimes they'll make promo images for you and sometimes you make promo images <laughs> and share them with the team. So it really depends publisher to publisher and contract to contract. Um, hopefully if, if you, I always say like, there's no harm in asking politely, you know, if you need help coming up with something, um, you, you can have the conversation with your agent or if you have a good relationship with your publicist, just being like, Hey, would you be able to help me put together X, Y, Z? And maybe they will, and maybe they won't. Um, but I always think there's a harm in asking. Uh, we've got a few questions about pen names and Sarah, you use pen name. Um, yeah. So you talked about varying the bio, but should they feel free to simply make stuff up as a persona for a, a pen name? And do you have any tips for an author who wants to keep the pen name secretive from their identity? Yeah, um, I don't recommend making stuff up. I think that could go very bad very quickly. <laughs> um, I mean, people people on social media love to like, you know, find the dirt about people. So I don't know. I just feel like it, that's a dangerous game there. Um, and then if you want to keep a pen name completely separate from your legal name, it's going to be very hard to do. You do have to sign contracts with your legal name. And um, there are ways of like getting that information a lot of the time. Um, if you want, if you need to remain like completely, completely secret. So like Chuck Tingle is a great example. Like that's someone that we, we have no idea what his real name is or anything. Um, he has an LLC and, uh, you know, all the work is done. All the contracts are signed via the LLC instead of him as a person. Um, so there are ways of doing it, but it is oftentimes very tedious <laughs> to do, um, but if you do need to do it, um, just make sure that your team knows that like you want to keep your your real name secret and every, you want everything to be under your pen name as much as possible. Um, but you will have to sign contracts using your real name. So um, that's up. For sure. I, of course, am privy to many people, many authors' uh, secret names working at the Authors Guild, uh, but we're a vault, so don't worry. Um, but I've noticed that some authors, in fact, have their real photos on both, even though it's a secret publicly, mm -hmm. with you know lighting and hairstyling and everything. They just use their real face uh, in different ways. Uh, yeah, there are definitely people who like obscure it, like, or will take a picture like from the back, and that honestly, it like it's not a great way to connect with readers if you have to have hide your identity that much. So you better be able to connect with people in a different way. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, some people do have the need to to conceal their identity. So do what makes you feel comfortable. Uh, and also always, always talk to your agent um, or your editor, or your publicist or whoever you have in your corner um, to see how they can help you develop that strategy. All right, well, as one last question, we touched on bookstores a bit, but um, any further tips on what they should bring into a bookstore or is it, uh, should you only do this at bookstores you you shop at? Yeah, so bookstores, it's it, it's interesting because I haven't worked a lot directly with bookstores, but I actually, because I um, I am an advisor to a bookstore, I am in this this group of uh, bookstore owners and employees, and I've learned a lot uh, just in the last two years from them. Where basically they get they get frustrated very easily <laughs> by authors asking for things. Um, they especially get frustrated if they've never seen you before in the bookstores in particular. Um, and they also get frustrated if it's like a demand versus an ask. So I, I always just recommend, you know, be polite as possible, never demand anything. Um, you know, use, you, use <laughs> your politest <laughs> ways of writing things, you know, like, oh, I know you must be really busy but if you have time, blah, 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 right? And always try to, whenever you're, Anytime you're like seeking an opportunity like that, um, I always like recommend just try to match the communication style of the people that you're talking to as well. You know, if you call someone and they're like, hey, can you email me? Don't argue with them. Don't insist that you need to talk on the phone or you need to meet in person. Um, people do it with us all the time because we have to do that form. We have that form that every author that does an event with us has to fill out before we talk to them. 
and people are like can I just talk to someone and I'm like yes after you fill out the form like um and so just follow you know whatever someone is asking you to do just do it um I hate talking on the phone but if you know if USA Today called me and was like we will do an interview with you but only on the phone I'll do it you know because they they have more power than I do they have more clout than I do so um, always just try to match the communication style as much as you can. If you have a disability, don't be afraid to ask for accommodations. And if they refuse those accommodations, then they're not very nice people. But, um, you know, if you're capable of doing it. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess bookstores get contacted by authors all the time who are very, very rude to them or very, very demanding. And so just make sure you are not one of those authors. And I think you'll have the best results. All right. Well, this has been wonderful, wonderfully informative. Uh, we'll send out uh, the handout and, and other resources in an email to everyone who registered. So everyone will, will have the information they need. I know you've got some questions for the Authors Guild and our web services team. Please know that you can always email support at authorsguild.org and we'll be happy to help. Uh, but Tamara, Kawar, and Sarah and Fisk, thank you so much. Thanks to AALA and Literary Agents of Change for helping us put this together. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much.